Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Chrismore, and I am a principal data analytics architect and developer advocate with Zebra Technologies. I uh, am going to present today on the data visualization techniques for the device usage and health APIs. So the introduction to this is that over the past several years, we've been able to put up quite a, an offering of APIs that are providing data about all of the aspects of our devices. It's been a huge evolution over the, over the past several years. And this year we're trying to make it go another step. Uh, I wanna make sure to, to be clear at the very beginning of this presentation that for the demos that I'm going to provide, I've chosen one of the simplest uh, of the APIs. The, the signal strength API is perhaps not the type of data you would wanna report on. Uh, perhaps you were looking for something in the repair life cycle or in the, the device count or some sort of history. But what I'm trying to do today is keep everything that I'm doing as simple as possible so that we can really achieve the connectivity that's been a, a problem in the past. So the customer feedback that we had was that the connectivity with our previous three-step authentication process, it, it was really a little bit too much. Uh, if, if you've experienced it, I'm sure you know what I, I'm talking about, but to summarize, you would provide the initial token to try to get your connectivity. It would send you to a website where you would log in with your ID, provide your credentials and authorize a particular device, which is not quite what the analytics community is doing. It would ask you to, to authorize that connection and then it would return a refresh token back to your side. And that refresh token had the additional problem that it would expire after 60 minutes. And so then you would need to run a refresh operation. What we've realized is that the analytics community wants to see the ability to connect a, a third party application or a third party server to their data and they wanna be able to get to that data. So again, I'm, I'm keeping everything simple here and I'll be showing demos in Postman I'll be showing demos in, in Python. And then finally, I'll, I'll just do an initial connection with Power BI. Even though I'm using those tools, everything that I'm doing here is generic enough that you can use it in whatever your tool of choice is. And so what we're announcing here for DevCon is that we've created a streamlined read-only access to simplify our data analytics operations. I'm, I'm going to show you how to consume our APIs for analytics purposes. So I'm going to compare the full authentication process to our new analytics authentication process. In the full authentication, everything works in read write mode and often has, or I guess I should say always has a device ID associated with it. Even if you're just reading data at the authorization screen for the web page you're actually auth authorizing a device ID. So the full authentication process is still required for writing data because we need to know what device is actually doing the writing. But in the analytics authentication, we just want to read the data so we can consume it within an analytics process. There's a standard onboarding process. I'm sure that most of the folks on this, on this conference have actually going through it, you log into the developer portal, you identify yourself, you provide your ID, and you receive a set of credentials. For the analytics authentication piece, there's a special onboarding process. You still go ahead and do all of the steps you did before. And in new accounts that are created right now, most people will end up having the special onboarding automatically taken care of. For some of our older accounts, especially if you've had your account for more than a year, uh, there is an additional association where we need to try to associate uh, an ID, an email address with your ID, and everything has to interact as far as the login needs to be the email address, and then we need to use your token, and it identifies you. The, the new process is, I guess I should say that the old process had a three-step interaction. I've kind of already summarized that. You request a token, you visit a website, and then you use the token and, and receive a refresh token. In the new system, we're gonna focus on this concept of 
of it's an API key, but the value that's being passed in the header is X dash API key. And that's for the authorization piece. There in the new process, there is no token and there is no expiration to your token. If your token needs to be changed or revoked, the, the token can be changed or revoked by contacting support. The old process, as I mentioned, provides VIQ with very device specific information so that a device can record its data into our API. And the downside of that old process is that it has a 60 minute token expiration. And the reason that token expiration is so problematic for the analytics community is that if you're using a third party application such as Power BI or Tableau or Click to be able to connect to this process, that 60 minute token has to be refreshed on the server, usually by an administrator. We're specifically designing this new analytics authentication process to allow your administrator to put in their X API key into the server once and to move forward for months without having it expire. So on this special onboarding, we do have a recommendation that you choose to use a long-term administrator account as your email address. We would like you to be very forward looking in possibilities for headcount turnover or staffing changes. We would like you to think about what email address will still be in existence a year from now, uh, regardless of any of those staffing issues. You create the account on the developer portal. You must log in at least once. Uh, I think that it's been publicized throughout the conference what the address for the developer portal is, but just to restate, it's developer.zebra.com. And as a final note, in some cases, not everyone and not a majority of folks, but in some cases, our support team may need to manually associate your administrator email to your API key. In such a case, you can contact your partner representative or you can contact support. So to get your X API key from the developer portal, the value on this screen is consumer key. It's down under credentials. You can see here, it's, it's going to be blocked out by default, but you can go ahead and click the, the eye icon, the, the eyeball icon to get the, the consumer key to show. Whenever I refer to X API key throughout this presentation, I'm going to be referring to that consumer key. The reason I'm going to keep calling it the X API key instead of calling it the consumer key is because I want you to associate that as part of the header authentication that's going on. Whenever you call one of our APIs, you call the header and the header must say X API key rather than saying consumer key. Also, during my demo, I know that I will be showing one of my X API keys on the screen. I know that some uh, security pur purist would view that as, as an error in my presentation. I want to assure everybody that the key that I've chosen is not only changeable, but it has very, very limited credentials only to get to our demo uh, companies, and it cannot get to anywhere else within, within Zebra or within the customer base. So I'm gonna go through three demos. My three demos, the first demo is a Postman demo. This is, this is just troubleshooting basic connectivity with the APIs. Demo number two, I'm going to show you how we would consume things within Python. And demo number three, I'm going to show connectivity for Power BI. On this particular slide, I've provided a screenshot. And what I want you to see is what the Power BI connectivity is. And just to reiterate what I said on the previous slide, there, there is an HTTP request header that does have parameters that must be passed in. Uh, you must pass in your X API key in all these cases. You must pass in your company name and you must pass in your partner name. And if there's any deviation from this, you will get a 403 forbidden message back. So let's go ahead and get started with the, the demos. The first demo that I would like to work on is the Postman demo. Uh, many of you have already downloaded our JSON files uh, that are configuration files for Postman to be able to connect using the old authentication methodology. This is the full authentication that is read and write 
that is uh, going to allow your devices to write, but it may not necessarily be the best option for analytics. If you've downloaded the majority or the, the core of those JSON files, your left-hand side of Postman will look like this, where you still have auth for device flow. You can generate a device code. You can get an access code from the device or where you can ask for a refresh token. Uh, this is very common and many of you will already have experience working with it. The authorization has this bearer token uh, installed with it. This is not an API key. This token is the refresh token that comes back from the system that only survives an hour. This particular token has already expired, but it's still in here showing what the last value was when I, when I ran this. The key to the authorization is that on this authorization, it inherits from the project. And at the project level, what it's really doing is, is a bearer token authentication. So every time that we're doing this, the box is grayed out. You don't have a choice. As long as auth authorization is set on that screen, it's going to force the bearer token to go. I'm going to switch to a different workspace that is API key based. And again, I'm going to stay just with the site status. The data is very simple, very easy to work with. Uh, but as I've said previously in the presentation, you can choose any of the APIs to do this type of work. A key here is that the, the required fields that I'm filling in are the X API key, along with an, an API key that I've built that does not have uh, any real privileges. It can get into demo company too. It can get into partner demo. If you attempt to copy this X, X API key, it will be deprecated in the future. So you really need to use your own key for this experimentation. Uh, the X API key is getting sent in the header, the company names being sent in the header and the partner names being sent in the header. A key that you have to do to make any changes to your existing Postman effort is you must go to authorization and you must change the authorization type to say no auth authorization. And the reason is that that Postman will keep overwriting your header if this authorization screen is sent. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to hit the send button to show that we do have round trip status. And I end up getting back a 200 okay message, 1357 milliseconds, 5.64 kilobytes. This is an important thing to note. I think there is more than uh, 250 rows of data. Uh, you, need to, you need to pay attention that on your URL, we often have this limit equals 250 to prevent huge data sets from coming back you will need to adjust that for your own application. Down in the pretty version of the response, we do have our success uh, message status 200. We do have a meta area and we do have links. And then we have this critical data area. This data area is what we're looking for when we're doing our, our analytics or our visualization efforts. So all of our data is in JSON format and it's easily consumable by uh, several other technologies that are available in here. So what I want to do is I want to transition out of my Postman demo and I want to move toward the Python demo. And Postman makes it very easy for you to move from one to the other because they provide you the source code. Over on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a less than greater than sign with a slash on it through it. If you hover over it, it'll, it'll give you a tooltip to say that this is code. If I click there, it provides me with the Python code that I need. In fact, it'll, it'll provide you with any of the major code bases that you might end up using. For the purposes of demo number two, I'm going to go through the Python code and I'm going to use the request object because it's one of the easiest objects. Uh, what I want you to notice from the very beginning is that the, the headers that are going through are the three required headers. X API key, company name, partner name. Also your URL is clearly displayed for you. So if you're ever trying to reverse engineer against the URL, you know exactly what, you, what URL the Postman ended up doing. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go over to a Colab notebook. This is not normally what I would end up using. Normally I would end up using Databricks or one of the, the Google platform Jupyter notebooks. I'm doing this in Colab so that it's easily repeatable by the majority of the user community. 
If you've never been out on Colab, it's, it's colab.research.google.com. And it's a, a fully powered free way of running Jupyter Notebooks. If you remember my request import was down in the next section of code, I always end up moving that to the top just for clarity of which libraries I'm using. So field number, command number one is literally the list of all of the imports that I'm gonna use for this demo. And then command number two is literally the code that I copied and pasted from Postman over here into the, um, uh, the Colab window. Uh, I almost said Databricks window. Um, the, the data that's coming back is exactly like Colab or like Postman showed us. It's literally got all of that devices data in it. It starts with a data section. Um, so right here, you can see our data tag is inside the uh, returning JSON. So in the next section, I want to change my JSON into a, a data frame. Let me go ahead and run a couple of these so we don't end up uh, having anything strange going on. You can see that my code's running very, very fast. It's, it's telling me one second, which is consistent with Postman, which is 1.3 1, 1 seconds. Um, and then what I want to do is I want to convert my response from JSON into a pandas data frame. Working with pandas data frames in uh, Python is like one of the most common industry tools that you'll see used. So this is a way to get it into a, a format that everybody can consume and a lot of our other tools can consume. It's a very quick operation. It shows me I've got four columns, site name, poor devices count, good devices count, and excellent devices count. Now, one of the steps in analytics is to be able to augment your data. So when I look at that and I have poor, good, or excellent, what I feel like I'm missing is I'm missing a total column. So as my next step, what I want to do is I'm going to create this total column called, called total devices count. And this is a little bit of a manual way of doing it, but I just basically said series one plus series two plus series three. And then I'm asking again, show me the head of that. And now my total devices count uh, column appears. And you can see 130 plus 120 plus 135, that definitely does equal 385. So it, it is absolutely working the way we expected. For the example that I wanna provide you, I wanna create a Pareto chart. This particular data set I believe has um, uh, quite a few rows in it. It, it goes uh, for quite a bit. I only wanna look at the top 10 rows. And so in a Pareto chart, one of the, one of the easiest ways in Python to just get the top 10 items is to just ask your data frame for the n largest records. I'm going to give it a 10. If you want your prayer chart to say 20, just change that to 20. However you want it to be, change the size. And I'm going to ask it to key off of this column called poor devices count. I run that. And now my data frame is much smaller. In fact, if we go ahead and we just add a row here and we ask for bf2.head and run that, uh, you'll see that Actually, let's not do that. Let's just go ahead and say DF2, show me the whole data frame. You'll see that I've only got 10 records. And so they, these are the 10 records that are going to be getting graphed. And so there is the very quick and dirty, just easy bar chart uh, to make a Pareto chart. Um, if you're wondering how to get to this uh, horizontal bar format so that our wording comes out nice and legible, there is an option to say you want to orient horizontally. So that's kind of the, the quick and dirty Pareto chart that we end up working with. It's being done in a package of Seaborn. And you can see that I render a perfectly useful um, uh, Pareto chart that tells me where my poor, my poor devices count are. Obviously, I can change the X and Y axis names, and I can use the chart. There are also more elaborate versions of charts in Seaborn available. And I've provided an example here. We'll be checking this code in uh, to GitHub so that it can be accessed by the general user community. The, the more elaborate code uh, ends up creating a couple of plots, overlays them, but allows me to see really what my poor devices are compared to what all of my total devices are. And it's sorting them by you know, whatever has the, the greatest poor device count but this kind of visualization is easily done within Python. This is just a simple example. There is a lot of 
analytical work available to the community. Once you get the data into this data frame format, uh, any of the visualization packages within Python can actually get, get it into graphical format. But I wanna take this one last step, one demo further. And the demo is, is the Power BI demo. And so, so when we're in Power BI, uh, we'll get these startup screens. When we're in Power BI, I want, I want everyone to know that Power BI is just something that we very commonly use at Zebra. Uh, it does not have to be Power BI. It can be Tableau, it can be Click. Nearly all of the major visualization tools that are out there on the market have the exact same mechanism for connecting to an API that I'm going to show you here. So what we wanna do is we wanna go up to file and we wanna say, get data. And when it asks us to get data on Power BI, the key here is we're stating that we want to get our data from the web. So when we go to get the data from the web, it pops up an interface and I can just go ahead and type in the basic if I want, but what I really need to do is get, get those headers passed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I wanna to switch to advanced. I can actually come back to my Jupyter notebook or my, my CoLab notebook and I can copy this URL, uh, just copying it right out of the notebook and I can paste it into advanced. I wanna make sure everyone sees the mistake that I'm doing here because this is an intentional mistake meant to, to show you design problems that we will end up having in the data. I've limited this data in the URL to 250 records. That is probably not appropriate for you to set up a Power BI server. Your administrators would be coming in and trying to set up a Power BI server so that the users could reuse the data set and they could reuse the visualization and limiting the data to 250 rows when it might easily be tens of thousands of rows that's actually a, an error during the setup. So, so please make sure that you understand that, that the offset equals zero means you're starting at the, the beginning of the data set and that limit equals 250 means that you're limiting your data set coming back to just 250 rows. Probably the offset is going to be appropriate at any time you're doing this and the limit is not going to be appropriate for any time you're doing this. As I've said, I need to get uh, three sets of headers in here. Uh, so it's just exactly the way you see it on the Python screen, and it must be typed exactly this way or you will get rejected. So XAPI key is the key value we've been talking about all along. Company name with small c and capital N. Partner name with small p, capital N. And we're just literally going to take the values you used in your Python app, we're just gonna cut and paste them in there. And so uh, I come over and grab the XAPI key and I paste it. I grab my company name, which has to be correct. Uh, or again, that'll be an authentication failure. And I pick my partner demo and I, I place that into the partner name. At this point, this is the same screenshot that I showed you in the presentation. This is the connectivity information that you need to use the new authentication format for analytics. And when I say, okay, it's going to reach out and it's going to contact our API and it's going to ask what's in the API, what data do you have, can I see it? And then we end up with this Power Query Editor that pops open. This is a standard item within Power BI and it's literally showing you all of the columns that are available in the data. And if you, if you recognize from our Python data frame, when we were over here on uh, looking at the top of the data frame, I think site demo operation 23 had 131 poor devices count. And you can see over on the new data set, site demo operation 23, 131 devices. This data that's been pulled into Power BI is exactly the same data that's being pulled into Python. And then you can go into Power BI and you can build whatever reports you want. You can limit columns, you can only pull certain items, you can do whatever it is you need to do to get your report up and running. And then Power BI becomes a quick and easy tool for you to use this Power Query. So in summary, what I've done is I've done three demos. Demo one was to show you how to use Postman to establish connectivity, prove that the connectivity is working and get basic Python code out of the system. 
I then transitioned over to a CoLab environment and I used that Python code to connect live out to our APIs and pull the data into Python for visualization. And then, you know, you don't have to use the Python code to move to Power BI or Tableau or whatever you're using. But I, I did that for ease of, of cut and paste capability. And I showed you what the setup screen needs to look like for Power BI to operate. The key is knowing that those three fields are what needs to be passed to make this connectivity work. It's not about the tool being Power BI. The other tools will work. And any method that you have that's capable of connecting to a REST API in any language should connect using this exact same methodology. So that's, that is what we were trying to present. Uh, we're making this available now for DevCon and we're looking forward to working with our user community and seeing what it is that they do to come up with the, the next visualizations for our visibility APIs our visibility IQ APIs. Um, thank you very much.